Now, the Environmental Audit Committee has published a report today calling on the government to establish a carbon border to prevent, to prevent the UK's aim for net zero emissions being undermined by cheaper foreign imports. Putting a price on imported carbon can incentivise sectors to move away from those carbon-intensive practices and promote behaviour to change to more low-carbon products. Well, joining me now to discuss this more is Philip Dunn, the chair of the Environmental Audit Committee. Welcome to the programme. I, I suppose, first of all, the UK tries to put a price on carbon in many different ways. We've got different sectoral approaches. It's a very complicated picture. This proposal, adding a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, would this not further complicate an already complicated picture? Well, I think the main point of it, Tom, is to try to provide uh, uh, less disincentive to UK manufacturing. So at the moment, we have uh, an emissions trading scheme for UK manufacturers, but 43% of our, our to territorial production emissions um, are missed because these come from uh, imports. So it's trying to level up the playing field for British manufacturers and to reduce the risk of carbon leakage uh, to offshore jurisdictions. So we think it's a, it's a fairness issue uh, for, for the UK and for consumers. Yes, it would be complicated, but uh, this is why we've been calling for the government to start consulting on this topic because it's coming round the corner. The EU have announced that they're going to introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism um, by the end of 2023. There's an initial discussions going on within government, but it's not really been aired with the with the public, with consumers, with uh, with manufacturers. And we think we need to to get on and do that. And that's really why we published this report to raise awareness to start uh, the, the conversation going. Of course, and I suppose carbon leakage is a very important subject because, of course, if we decarbonise an industry here, stop making something and then only import that thing that's made in China or elsewhere, the same amount of carbon is going into the planet's atmosphere or maybe even more if it's done in it's a country with, more, indeed, with fewer regulations. We've already got much higher standards than apply in many other countries. So it needs to be done in conjunction with standard setting and really ideally on a multilateral basis with other trading blocks uh, and because of our role both as continuing president of COP26 until November and because we've come out of the EU we are negotiating trade agreements right across the world at the moment. We, we're in a good place to start raising this issue you know, within the rules of the WTO uh, with the different trading blocks who are starting to look at this in particular the EU, but also others. Um, and, and now is the time to get our heads around what are the issues that are going to affect uh, UK manufacturers and producers. I think that intellectually, a lot of people can understand, particularly from a pro-market perspective, putting a price on carbon is a good market mechanism by which we can discount the externalities of higher carbon emissions. However, when it comes to deploying these sort of processes in practice, there are a lot of worries that it might look like protectionism for example, just to make imports more expensive, maybe even increasing prices for consumers who are already facing a cost of living crisis. How do we square that circle? Well, I think you're, you're right that people may have that concern. And certainly we're not arguing that this has to come in uh, today. This is not going to exacerbate the immediate cost of living crisis. What we're calling for is for the, the government to start a consultation by the end of this year and for the Chancellor to announce in uh, budget next year, 2023, uh, what his, his uh, ob objectives are uh, in trying to bring introdu introduce such a measure. We know that, it, that the EU are planning to introduce such a measure from the end of 2023, as I've already said. So you know, we've got a couple of years to get this uh, worked out and to try and implement something ideally in tandem with other trading blocks. So it's done on a multilateral basis rather than the UK. Um, mm. uh, sort of, forging ahead on its own. Well, talking about taking time to get things worked out, it was over a month ago now that the Prime Minister promised the energy strategy would be appearing within days. Why, in your view, has this long-awaited energy strategy been quite so long-awaited? Well, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask somebody in the government as to what the debate that has been going on. But clearly there has been a, a debate, I imagine, between 
uh, base and the Treasury as to how what the finer details of this might look like. Um, I called on the Prime Minister in the Liaison Committee last week uh, to, to spell out what, what the energy strategy is going to be uh, and how it's going to fit within the government's wider net zero ambitions. And I'm pleased to say he was very forthright in saying that he absolutely intends no watering down of net zero Britain uh, through the energy security strategy. And that, you know, the current indications are that it may come out uh, later this week. Certainly. Uh, we're, we're thinking it will come out on Thursday, I suppose, uh, from an environmental audit perspective, what are the key tenets of that strategy that you would like to see announced? Well, we've done very well as a country at reducing our emissions in our energy generation, reducing reliance on fossil fuels. We've phased out coal. But undoubtedly, there is a, uh, there is a continuing need for fossil fuels, for oil and gas, during the transition to generation from renewables and nuclear. So first off, I'm expecting to see a significant uh, emphasis on nuclear generation, uh, because as it takes eight to 10 years to get nuclear plants up and running, you know, the, the confidence needs to be established, the, um, the, the structures, the types of uh, system, both, both from a technological and a funding perspective, uh, that all needs to be in place. And the sooner that's agreed, the, the quicker uh, it will be to be able to get uh, operation, operations up and running, which is very important. So that's a key plank. Another is the scope for, um, for renewables, both offshore wind and tidal energy, where the government has made a, an encouraging announcement last autumn. I'd like to see a lot more there because I think we've got huge potential for the UK for tidal energy, which doesn't rely uh, on the wind or the sun, uh, and also obviously solar. So I think renewable energy has an important part to play, but fossil fuels will need to be there during the transition. And I would like to see us focusing more on uh, on the UK, on you exploiting remaining UK assets rather than relying on imports from volatile parts of the world. Um, and we, as a committee, have just announced uh, again at the end of last week that we'll be doing an inquiry into uh, what can be done in relation to uh, remaining oil and gas reserves in the North Sea on the UK continental shelf um, and how those can be extracted again in accordance with our net zero ambitions without breaching the Paris climate change uh, uh, limit. Yes, well, I think there'll be a lot of support there for using our own hydrocarbons rather than relying on nefarious dictatorships around the world, at least in our transition. Well, Philip Dunn, for now, thank you very much for joining us and talking through those important issues for everyone.